Hello and welcome friends, I am Dr. Amit Chavla, Professor Amity University, Haryana. I am a PhD in Mass Communication, alumni of IIM Kashipur and a qualified trainer from ITC Netherlands. In the last 20 years, I have mentored UG, PG and PhD students of various institutions like NIFT, Jamia Millia Islamia, Delhi University, Sharda University, Amity University, GGS IP University and more. I have also been associated with names like Doordarshan, Sahara India, Canon, PIB, SSC, Jagran Group, etc. I have authored and edited four books, contributed chapters and articles in 11 books and index journals and have shot thousands of photos and videos till day. I am also the founder of Photoshala, which is India's first one-stop destination for education, shoots and consultancies related to still photography and video production. In today's episode, I shall be sharing various ways of classifying still photography cameras and about some of the major accessories used in digital photography. After studying this module, you shall be able to categorize and use cameras based on size, form, usage, sensor size and lens changing options, enumerate advantages and limitations of camera types like smartphone, digicams, bridge cameras. DSLRs and mirrorless cameras, distinguish between wide angle, normal, telephoto, prime, zoom lens and explain the importance of optical stabilization, enlist factors to consider while choosing a tripod and monopod, discuss and use the application of different variants of SD card, CF card, memory sticks, etc. Classification of still photography cameras. There are numerous ways of how still photography cameras are classified. Based on their physical size and usage, cameras can be grouped as compact point and shoot cameras, bridge cameras, prosumer cameras and professional cameras. While compact cameras are smallest and lightest, they usually offer the least controls over exposure and focus. Smartphone cameras can also be kept under this bucket. However, they are inexpensive alternatives to capturing photographs. Bridge cameras look and feel bigger. They also allow additional controls of exposure and focus. Some higher end bridge cameras may even give manual controls and great quality. Prosumer cameras are positioned by the camera manufacturers to be used by enthusiasts and they would usually allow you to change lenses, control exposure and other settings. Highest in the range are the professional cameras. They offer the highest quality and controls possible but are usually expensive, bulky and heaviest. Based on the sensor size, cameras are classified as crop sensor cameras, full frame sensor cameras and large format cameras. Full frame cameras refer to the cameras that have imaging sensors equivalent to the size of a 35mm film used in the older days. With larger sensor size, the quality captured and its other details improved tremendously. Cameras with sensor size smaller than 35mm are referred to as crop sensor cameras. These include all mobile cameras, compact cameras, bridge cameras and even beginner range of mirrorless and DSLR cameras. There can be cameras with sensor size larger than 35 mm too. These are called large format cameras and are used by high end photographers for their extremely fine quality and image sizes. Next classification is based on the option of changing lenses. With lens changing options, the versatility of using the cameras in various situations improve. While most enthusiasts and beginner cameras are non-interchangeable lens cameras, 
but all mirrorless, DSLR and upward cameras allow the user to change lenses. While the option of using film or digital as a medium may seem too basic criteria for their classification, it is possibly one of the most important ones. As discussed earlier also, the pinhole cameras or camera obscuras were the earliest cameras to be used. That simplest camera design consisting of light proof space with an o opening which is very small. These can even be made at home. Due to the small diaphragm and the light intensity being so low and therefore they can be used to observe or capture even the solar activity. Aside, these are lensless camera designs and therefore they can be miniaturized to be used as spy cameras or can also be made as big as the size of a room. View cameras were commonly used in the 1800s and is still used today, though with many refinements. In these, the front place had a lens mount where different lenses could be mounted. With help of cardboard bellows, the lens plane was connected with the rear plane that had a ground glass where the exposure was made. As the bellows were made of cardboard, the front and the rear planes could move independently of each other due to which the perspective correction was possible. Due to this unique feature, its results were admired by architectural photographers and till date, it remains the most economical option to shoot large format architectural photographs with, cor with, with corrected perspective. However, it had some trade-offs too, like it was bulky and mostly had to be used on tripods. Also, the photographer had to compose a dim inverted image on a ground glass and that too under a dark curtain. The development of twin lens reflex or TLR cameras made it very convenient for photographers to carry their equipment as these were lighter and portable. As the name suggests, these had two lenses, one of which used to compose the image and other to capture it. Due to this, cameras suffered from a shift in the viewpoint or what is called parallax error. As you were not shooting exactly what you were seeing, it caused many problems. Still, this design was appreciated for its portability and professional exposure controls that it offered at the time. To solve the problem of parallax error, a new film camera design was introduced specially keeping the professionals in mind. It was called single lens reflex or SLR camera. The SLRs used only one lens for composing and capturing the shot, thus there was no question of parallax error. These were made on the principle of periscope. The light after passing through the lens assembly is bounced off a mirror angled at a 45 degree and placed right behind the lens. Above the, above the lens, it is a penta prism that makes the inverted image straight and passes on to the viewfinder so that the photographer can compose the, sh the shot. When the photographer presses the shutter release button, the mirror flips the shutter opens and the light hits the film which is placed behind the mirror and the shutter. Thus, for a brief period of time, the light is not going to the viewfinder and there is a small blackout in the viewfinder during the time of actual exposure. The exposure possibilities, lens changing possibilities and quality of images were so high that the design continues to be used in various digital versions of these cameras even today. Many of you may have seen or even used a digital SLR or a DSLR. Without discussing about Polaroid instant cameras, this discussion shall remain incomplete. Other than instant cameras, there was no other film camera at that time which allowed one to see the instant photograph. Polaroid developed a system where instead of shooting a negative, the light exposure was made directly on a positive photo paper that were developed within the camera itself using some patented chemicals. Instant cameras by Polaroid were an instant success to the instant gratification that they offered. However, in these cameras, one could not change the size, share a copy or edit the pictures. Additionally, the film it used was very expensive and thus was not accessible to many. Digital cameras. 
experiments with digital technology started in 1980s and many digital cameras have been introduced in the past 30 to 35 years. There are several digital camera designs that are commonly available in the market. These include compact point and shoot cameras, bridge cameras, DSLRs and even mirrorless. Then there is one which is the most frequently used and the one which is always carry with us. Yes, I am talking about our mobile cameras. Let us begin our learning about digital cameras with mobile cameras. The best thing about mobile camera is the ability to instantly shoot, edit and share wirelessly any image that we take. The technological advancement over the years have helped them capture decent pictures with great clarity and quality. They are also lighter, sleeker and they are supplemented with numerous smart apps to make our experience splendid. However, there are some problems that are associated and inherent to this design. For example, the low light performance is almost always a challenge for mobile cameras due to the small sensor size. Additionally, they usually do not offer optical zoom. Though there is an option of digitally magnifying the image, it comes at a cost of pixelation. These days, camera phones offer LED flash, but it is far less effective than the flash or of even a basic compact point and shoot camera. Aside, any decent camera phone costs much higher than an average compact camera. Digicams or the compact point and shoot digital cameras are intelligent imaging devices with automatic controls over exposure, focus, flash, digital video, etc. Further, they offer optical zoom and better low light performance than mobile cameras. An average Digicam would not probably burn a big hole in your pocket, though it is sleek and light enough to fit almost all pockets. Still. There are many reasons why many would not buy them. The first reason is that there is very less exposure and focus control that these cameras give in the hand of the user. Secondly, there is no viewfinder in these cameras and the large LCDs or LED screens drain out the camera batteries very fast. Other than that, they have no option of changing lenses and usually have a limited optical zoom. To sum it up, it cannot be generally used for professional purpose. Bridge cameras were introduced to bridge the gap between the compact point and shoot and the DSLRs. They somewhat resemble the look of a DSLR, offer some degree of manual control, may even have an electronic viewfinder, but usually will not give you option to change lenses. They are particularly popular with enthusiasts who want high zoom range or some more exposure control, but do not intend to invest in a DSLR. However, their low light performance and image quality does not match that of a mirrorless or a DSLR. At the same time, they have shutter lag and therefore also have a slower imaging speed. DSLR or digital single lens reflex cameras are popular choice among serious photographers and professionals. They inherit the optical mechanism from SLRs, but have digital image sensors and processors for high quality digital imaging. Though there are so many advantages of DSLR, some of the top ones that are they give less grains or noise than the ones discussed before allow you to change lenses and capture uncompressed image in raw format, don't give parallax error, offer extremely fast camera operations and offer maximum flexibility of controlling exposure, color, depth, etc. In addition, there are countless number of accessories available for DSLR designs to make the photography experience better. A trade-off of this design is that it is slightly bulky and sometimes heavy. Plus, due to the reflex action of the mirror, there is a blackout in the viewfinder during the exposure. Mirrorless have been making a steady progress and increasing their camera market share since 2008. The main reason for their steady growth is its lightweight and compact size than DSLRs.
They are also known to be slightly faster and maybe even better for videos. Additionally, they offer equally good control of exposure and depth as compared to a DSLR. However, as on date, mirrorless cameras have fewer options when it comes to lenses and accessories. Many users also find them a little too delicate. Hope that by now you are better placed with your understanding about cameras and would be able to make informed choices about the right cameras as per your requirement. Camera accessories used in digital photography. Now that we are through with the cameras, we must learn about three common accessories that you may use with your cameras. I shall try and stay relatively general as photography gear changes constantly and the models may be updated from time to time by the time you watch this video. Lenses. Lenses are the most important accessory in any camera. They drive the quality of a photograph. They can also be the costliest and thus one must be very thorough about the lens they buy. First classification of lens is on the basis of focal length. Lenses with smaller focal length like 8mm, 10mm, 18mm, 24mm, 35mm, etc. allow wider field of view and thus are usually preferred by landscape photographers. As the barrel size is smaller, they are usually lighter and also allow more light to pass through. To relate to this, imagine a short tunnel from where more light would pass through than if you attempt to look through a mouth of a long tunnel. Distortion is one of the biggest trade-off of these lenses. However, many photographers use distortion for some really creative photography. Lens with focal length closer to 50mm offer a field of view almost equivalent to the human eye and therefore are called standard or normal lenses for 35mm or full frame cameras. Please note that normal focal length will change if you are using a cropped sensor camera or a large sensor camera. Lenses with longer focal length are called telephoto lenses and are preferred by sports and wildlife photographers amongst others. It is because they offer narrower field of view and thus the image looks a lot more magnified. Thus, if you cannot go closer to your subject, a good idea is to use a telephoto lens. However, there are many limitations associated with these. To start with, these can be heavy and bulky. Due to this, you may have to mount them on a tripod, especially during prolonged usage. As these lenses magnify the image, they also magnify any kind of a camera shake. However, if you wish to blur the foreground and background to achieve a shallow depth of field, these are the best buy for you. They can also be used to achieve best expressions in portrait or fashion photography as you do not have to go physically closer to your model. Next classification of lenses is based on the possibility of changing their focal length within the lens. If you can vary the focal length within the lens, it is called a zoom lens and the ones in which they do not allow you to change the focal length are called prime lenses or block lenses. Usually prime lenses are believed to offer better accuracy and sharpness of images. In zoom lenses, the ratio between the maximum and the minimum focal length is referred to as the zoom ratio. For example, there is a lens with 10mm to 100mm focal zoom. Thus, 100 to 10 will be 10x zoom ratio. While this is a common way of defining a lens in a compact digicam, it is not the best way as 10mm to 100mm is also 10x and 50mm to 500mm is also 10x zoom. Hence, zoom ratio offers no clarity on how much shall be the field of view. Apart from the focal length of the lens, another notable factor is to be considered while buying the lens is the image stabilization ability within the lens. If such a technology is available within the lens, it reduces the shake that may be visible especially when handheld photography is being practiced. Please note that different lens manufacturers name it differently. Like Canon calls it IS or image stabilization. Nikon calls it vibration reduction shot into VR. Sigma has coined it optical stabilization or OS. Vibrations or shakes 
cannot be completely eliminated using this technology and can be only reduced. Thus, for added stability, another accessory that is a tripod is recommended. Let us learn a little more about tripods. Tripods. Tripods come in various sizes, load bearing capacity and the material with which they are made. Let us learn about various considerations for choosing a tripod. The first factor is sturdiness or stability. The stability of any tripod will depend on the number of leg sections, material with which the tripod is made and the length of the legs. Best way to gauge the stability of a tripod is to test it by applying weight on it while it is fully open and checking if it is vibrating or stays stable. Tripod's weight is the second factor for consideration while choosing your tripod. While aluminum based tripods are lighter and best to carry around, they can be unstable. Alloy tripods are sturdy but heavy due to which they are preferred in studio environment. A good balance between weight and sturdiness may be achieved using carbon fiber tripods. However, these can be costlier than the former ones. Another factor is the ease of use. You would probably not want to buy a tripod that is too cumbersome to use. Ideal tripod should be quick and easy to set up and position. Ease of use also depends on the tripod's head which usually comes in variants like pan tilt, ball heads, etc. While you can control the position of your camera in two or three axes with pan and tilt head, ball heads are better as you can freely point the camera in any direction or axis before finally locking it up for the final shot. One variation of these tripod stands is a monopod, which instead of having three legs has a single leg. Though these are great for portability and offer great support for handheld photography, they may not give as sharp image as tripod due to the sheer lack of stability because of a single column holding the entire weight of your heavy lens and cameras. Memory cards. With all digital cameras, you need to have a memory card to store awesome photographs and videos that you may take from time to time. It is important for us to know their benefits and limitations. Let us start with the most commonly used memory card, the SD card. SD or the secured digital cards are supported by the most of the cameras. These are currently available in three sizes, original, mini and micro sizes. On the basis of your need, you can choose the memory or the data capacity of these cards which is defined in megabytes or gigabytes. SD cards come in many variants like the original SD standard capacity cards, SD high capacity or SDHC cards, SD extended capacity or SDXC cards and SD ultra capacity or SDUC cards. SD cards are also classified on basis of data transfer speeds. The transfer speed depends on class 2 which offers a read write speed of 2 megabytes per second while class 10 cards offer speeds of 10 megabytes per second. Higher data read write speeds are available with ultra high speed cards or with video speed class cards. SDSC cards were developed to improve on the multimedia card or the MMC standard that looked somewhat similar to the SD card but were actually a bit different. MMC cards were thinner, allowed slower data transfer rate, were lesser secured and did not have any read write protection notches like the SD cards. Another type of memory cards popular with higher end DSLR photographers are CF or compact flash cards. Not only are they a little larger in size and storage capacity, but offer high data transfer speeds. The last memory cards that were that we shall discuss are called memory sticks. These were made by Sony and released in several variants including Memory Stick Pro, Memory Stick Duo, Memory Stick Pro Duo, Memory Stick Micro and Memory Stick Pro HG. Today, Sony digital cameras also use the SD and SDHC memory cards and as on today, no new cards are being released since many years. Sony's memory sticks are 
most likely to be discontinued. Some more accessories that you may consider purchasing with your digital camera are good camera bags, camera and lens care kits, flash guns to tackle low light situations, memory card readers, reflectors, optical filters, etc. You may also consider buying extra batteries for long tours or assignments where you may not get time to charge your batteries between successive shots. Summary In this episode, we learned that photography cameras can be classified in various ways. On basis of their physical size and usage, cameras can be grouped as compact point and shoot cameras, bridge cameras, prosumer cameras and professional cameras. Based on the sensor size, cameras are classified as crop sensor cameras, full frame cameras and large format cameras. Further, they can be classified as cameras using film or digital medium and the last classification can be made on the option of changing lenses. Thereafter, this episode discussed about the features, advantages and limitations of different cameras including pinhole cameras, view cameras, twin lens reflex cameras or the TLR cameras, single lens reflex cameras, the SLR cameras, instant cameras, smartphone cameras, digicams, bridge cameras, SLRs or DSLRs, mirrorless cameras and others. Further, while learning about different accessories in photography, we understood that lenses can be classified on the basis of focal length or the field of view and whether one can zoom. Wide angle, normal and telephoto lens all have their own specific applications. Also we discussed about the zoom ratio and the ability to optically reduce vibration in lenses. Thereafter, we learned about various type of tripods and monopods and their classification on basis of sturdiness, material with which these are made, ease of use and heads. Lastly, different types of memory cards including SD cards, compact flash cards, memory sticks were also discussed. Conclusion As we come to the end of this episode, I am confident that now you should be able to categorize and use cameras based on size, form, usage, sensor size and lens changing options. Enumerate advantages and limitations of camera types like smartphones, digicams, bridge cameras, SLRs, DSLRs and mirrorless cameras. Distinguish between wide angle, normal, telephoto, prime and zoom lens and explain the importance of optical stabilization. Enlist factors to consider while choosing a tripod and monopod. Discuss the use and applications of different variants of SD cards, CF cards and memory sticks. I sincerely hope that this uh, session you found very useful and informative. With this we conclude this episode on classification of cameras and common accessories used in photography. That's all for today. Thanks and goodbye.